Yo, this is crazy to me. Check this out. So the new Star Wars film is here and while stargazing, I couldn't help but to realize how big our universe is. We're just a tiny grain in the sea of the cosmos. Is there other life out there? Is Star Wars happening within our own universe? So the universe is huge. So huge in fact that there's nothing that your brain can even imagine to compare it to, but we can try. Prepare yourself because things are about to get really isolated. So this is our Earth, and our Earth's diameter is 7,918 miles across, which would be one hell of a drive. But this is our Sun, and our Sun has a diameter of 863,706 miles across, which means you would have to line up 109 Earths side by side just to match the diameter of the Sun. That isn't too hard to visualize, right? Well, this is our entire solar system. Now can you visualize 109 Earths going across our sun? And what about now? This is the distance of about one light year. Those are nearby stars. This is a sea of stars. Now at 100,000 light years across, this is our Milky Way galaxy. Meanwhile, our observable universe is about 28 billion light years across. Yes, the universe goes on for more than 280,000 times more light years than our own galaxy. Again, way too big for our brains to even imagine. All right, so our universe is huge. I can understand that, sort of, but does the size of our universe have anything to do with Star Wars happening in our universe? Well, yes it does. You see, one of the first texts that pops up at the beginning of any Star Wars films is a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, which could imply many things, but let's focus on this far, far away galaxy being within our own universe. Now, I'm sure that for some of you guys, the first thing that probably comes to your mind is something like, yeah, right, if Star Wars existed somewhere in our universe, we'd surely detect it by now. But would we really though? Do you actually understand what our current methods for space indexing really consist of? The current and most common method for space indexing are 1. The wobble method, in which things like a planet orbiting things like a sun could show changes in the sun's position over time and making the sun appear to wobble, giving the name the wobble method. And 2. The transit method, which is a lot like the wobble method, but instead the sun is stationary. So instead of recording the position of the sun, we record planets transiting or crossing between that that sun in our recording device, giving the name transit method. If the result is less like being recorded on our device, then we suspect that something like a planet is orbiting that sun until we can confirm with more tests and observations. But you can see how these methods can become a problem. Not all planets will cross between their star and our recording device. For example, when we look up at the Vega star, which was once Earth's North Star, we're actually looking at its northern pole. So if Vega has planets, even if it's only 25 light years away from us, currently it'd be extremely difficult to discover if Vega has planets or not. Cool, so there's so little that we even know about our own galaxy, let alone our entire universe, which only increases the chances of Star Wars happening somewhere in our universe. But okay, okay, so it's very possible for Star Wars to be happening somewhere in our universe. and I'm cool with that, but what about our own galaxy? If Star Wars is happening somewhere in our own galaxy, how likely are starships to zoom by Earth? Well, first things first, how fast is the fastest thing that we know of, which is light? Light travels at about 186,000 miles per Earth seconds, or about 670 million miles per Earth hours. And with that, to get from Earth to the Vega star that was mentioned earlier, it would take 25 years. But why is this important? The diameter of our solar system is about 11 light hours, meaning to get from one end to the other would take about 11 Earth hours traveling at the speed of light. And the closest star after that would take some four years to reach. So if you have no business in a star system, why would you waste the time? And if you do have business, it's likely that you'd hyperdrive in, take care of business, then hyperdrive out. No detours and no scenic routes. So how fast is hyperdrive, you're wondering? Well, 
Hey guys, I just want to stop real quick and let you know that we're going full speed ahead into theory land beyond this point. So all these facts and stats is just fan research on a fantasy film. So please just keep that in mind. Let's continue. According to wikipedia.com, hyperdrive allows travelers to travel 120,000 light years in only a few hours or days. Now, to make this easier on us, let's just say that it's 120,000 light years per Earth day, or 1.39 light years per Earth seconds, which means to get from Earth to the Vega star mentioned earlier would only take 17 seconds using hyperdrive. But in the far, far away galaxy, they've established hyperways or routes that are mapped out with hyperpoints that are safe to hyperjump to and from without slamming into things like unmapped stars, asteroids, or black holes, which leaves most of the far, far away galaxy rarely, if ever, traveled at all. Take a look at the galaxy map. Could Earth be here? Hell, let's be realistic, even if Earth were here, right next to the hyperway, we wouldn't be able to see any starships cruising by at hyperspeed, because this tiny space alone is many, many, many light years in distance. But if we'd be so close, you're saying, we can create some device to capture these starships in the hyperways. MIT Media Lab researchers have created a way to video capture the speed of light at a trillion frames per second. Very inspiring stuff, but if you want to video capture a starship traveling at hyperspeeds, you need to take that 1 trillion frames per second and timesing it by 40 million. I'm not doing the math on that. I, I, I think we just need to realize that if starships really are hyperdriving past Earth, we won't be seeing them anytime soon. Whoa, who would have known how calculated the hyperdrive technology was? I mean, Georgie could have made it a bit more efficient, but uh, it's just a movie. Anywho, the final question that we must ask is, how possible is the physics of being a Jedi? So a Jedi's arsenal consists of his lightsaber and the force. So first, what do you need to make a lightsaber? Hmm. I know just the person to summon to answer this question. Oh, hey, Jabril. Hey, Jack. Take it away, Jack. Well, contrary to popular belief, lightsabers aren't light sabers. Well, I guess that they emit light, so they're kind of like lightsabers in that respect, but they are so much more. You see, when light is emitted, it essentially travels forever until met with something that will absorb and or reflect the light. So, if lightsabers were made with deadly lasers, it wouldn't stop in a couple of feet like they do in the films. So now you're wondering, what is a lightsaber made out of? Think plasma. You know that stuff that our sun is made out of? Exactly. Essentially, every single Jedi has a mini star strapped to their waist. I guess that's why they're so well respected. Ah, interesting. And what about the possibility of plasma cartridge lasers? Oh yeah, well, the short answer is, of course, even in the Star Wars galaxy, lightsabers seemed impossible. According to StarWars.Wikia.com, early lightsabers required a flexible cable that connected from the handle to a power pack worn on the belt to power it. They were highly inefficient, only being able to be used for a brief time before overheating. It wasn't until some 10,000 years later that the Star Wars technology was finally able to create efficient, cordless lightsabers. Now, as far as how we will go about developing these lightsabers, only time will tell. But to quote Jaden Corey from the Jedi Academy, a lightsaber without being a user of the Force is just a shaft of superheated plasma. Just a shaft of superheated plasma? That's fine with me, but Jack, tell us about the possibility of Sunday using the Force. <laughs> Whoa, nice try, Jabril, but I'm not going to be doing your whole video for you. Now, thank you very much for having me, but uh, I'll see you around. Ah, uh, fine. <sighs> How possible is it to Sunday use the Force? Star Wars original trilogy fans, prepare yourselves because here it comes. Midi, midi, midi,
As hated or loved as this concept may be, it just might make the force someday possible. Bear with me now. Georgi actually modeled midichlorians off of mitochondria, in which is needed to make a cell function. It's responsible for cell duplication and creating energy. Mitochondria and midichlorians have a lot of similarities, but the biggest difference is that midichlorians are linked with the force, in which the force is what binds all existing things together in the galaxy. Being in touch with your midichlorians gives you the ability to defy the laws of physics as we know it and change the different type of forces and beyond. So is it possible that midichlorians are an evolved or altered biological version of mitochondria? Is it possible that there's a force that binds all existing things together in our own galaxy and is waiting to be discovered? Here's a recent breakthrough study. Less than 6% of humans are capable of climbing Mount Everest without any help from extra oxygen. And a Himalayan culture called Sherpas are in that 6%. It's well known that the Sherpas have developed a superhuman ability at high altitudes. While the average human's blood flow will slow down at high altitudes, the Sherpa's blood flow stays normal, getting more energy for less oxygen. And for a long time, this was never really known why they had this superhuman ability, until Dr. Denny Levitt reported the findings on her study. The Sherpa's superhuman ability is all thanks to their remarkable efficiently evolved, believe it or not, mitochondria. Sure, I might be a nutcase going up against many great physicists arguing that some popular theories of physics might someday become outdated. It's fine, I'll take it. But to quote Carl Sagan, science is a way of thinking much more than it is a body of knowledge absolutely tremendous information. It's interesting to think that, sure, Star Wars may or may not exist in our galaxy or universe, and ultimately it's just science fiction, but sometimes the existence of science fiction can influence science fact. I mean, just take a look at hoverboards, for example. Sure, we're still a little ways off from actually owning one, but we've made great strides since the release of Back to the Future in 1985, which is why I have full confidence in saying that someday our children's children will run around slinging lightsabers, force pushing each other, jumping from star to star, indexing the cosmos, just as we all wish that we could. But you know, as big as our universe is, it's crazy that we haven't been visited from some other life yet. I mean, what if Star Wars really did visit our Earth? Would that pose some sort of threat? How Darth Brel, the time has come. Execute Order 84. As you wish, Master. Master Jedi, do you feel that? A disturbance in the Force. Yes, it is time to recruit new apprentices in preparation for what's to come. As you wish. Not much time. I need you to listen carefully, okay? Hey, I'm not the droid you're looking for, bro. I'm sorry. Oh, you are the, the chosen one. I'm looking for the force. There's the head. I must be going. Remember your training. Do you have another? Our hours of training are about to come to the test. There is a sit the head. Wait, are you actually Just remember. Serious? Our training is about to be put to the ultimate test. Just remember to use the force. Chosen one. All of our training has led up to this moment. You're about to be tested. Assist in tracking my location. Just remember to use the force. Hey, hey, take it back. I believe he's gonna take him out. I believe he's gonna take him out. 
Okay, chances are that Star Wars won't be invading Earth anytime soon, but it was fun to dress up in Star Wars and play around with some college kids. But disregarding that, today I have one simple question for you. Do you believe in aliens? Cast your vote using the annotations next to me. It'll take you back to the homepage in which I encourage you to subscribe for more content. And if you're on mobile, feel free to cast your vote using the comment section. But whatever the case may be, remember to always feed your curiosity. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known.